Hi, everyone. We're back with another episode of Fertility.SunCensored. I'm one of your hosts, Dr. Abby Eblen from Nashville Fertility Center. I'm joined by my spectacular and charming co-host and friends, Dr. Susan Hudson from Texas Fertility Center. Hey, everyone. And Dr. Carrie Bedient from the Fertility Center of Las Vegas. Hi, guys. Hey, guys. How are you doing? It's Good. been a while since we've seen each other. I know. I know. We... We had a few weeks hiatus, everybody traveling and doing new adventures. And and Abby, you got you got to learn how to do something new, didn't you? Oh my gosh. We were in Scotland this summer and I was not the driver, but my husband was. And, you know, in Scotland, just like in England, they drive on the left side of the road. And so um most of the roads in the bigger cities, there were interstates, and those were not quite as scary, but most of the roads that we drove on in the Scottish Highlands were saying that was two lane would be a little generous. It was like a lane and a half (laughs) and there's no shoulders and you're driving and these huge trucks are coming on the other side of the road. And it's, and it's so odd because you're used to being in the driver's seat on the left side, but yet you're the passenger and you see all this brush flying by your head and you're like, we're going to hit these trees. And it was, it was terrifying. And then the first few curves, you, I kept saying, okay, make a right into the left lane, make a right into the left lane. Cause you'd start to make a right and there'd be some giant bus, you know, and oh, it was so scary. And then the, really the final straw was all these roundabouts that in the smaller towns, they don't have red <laughs> lights, they're roundabouts and you're going the wrong way in the roundabout. So more than once, I felt like we were in like European vacation with Chevy Chase where we just <laughs> <laughs> round and around and around. So so somehow we managed to make it through Scotland for seven days in a car and didn't have a car accident. Ooh, there, I mean, there are a few little close calls, nothing major, but a few little close calls, but we made it in one piece. I remember when we were in England, when I was, I don't know, I was a teenager. So my mom was driving and we were in this tiny little town. And of course the streets are, you know, two, two lanes, but only like a car width and a half wide mm-hmm. yeah and um <laughs> my mom was going super slow and all it was like 5 p.m so all these people were walking home so there's this woman walking with uh, a bag of groceries and you could see the <laughs> egg carton come out well my mom accidentally tapped her groceries with the car and you could see this woman like pull <laughs> up her groceries and look at her eggs and uh and we uh kept driving because mom was afraid to stop the car because that meant that she would have to get back into traffic at some other point and like you get into those roundabouts and it's just pack a lunch you're going to be there all day just pack oh, a yeah lunch. We, yeah. we were driving too. We were trying to get gas and we could see the gas and it was catty corner, but we had to go around this roundabout. So we went around the roundabout and then we got off on the right place. Then there was another roundabout <laughs> and then we turned right into the gas station. We had, it was like three roundabouts in a row just to get in the gas station and they were all hooked together. It was bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> this is so funny. Oh my goodness. I don't know why I find this so funny, but you know, I just, I, I, in general, try to avoid when I avoid driving whenever I'm in a foreign country. Wow. So yeah. when we were, when we got back, my mom was really proud of herself that, you know, oh, well, you know, nobody got, nobody hit us. We didn't get into any major accidents, anything like that. And her friend was like, well, yeah, they could see your daughter's terrified face in the passenger <laughs> seat. Like everybody stayed 20 feet away from you. Cause they knew. I, normally, normally when I'm in a car on a car trip, I'll sleep somewhere along the line. I was like, my eyes were like this. They were like saucers and I was wide awake watching everything that was coming and going. It was kind of hard to relax and enjoy the scenery because you're so terrified that there's going to be somebody in the wrong lane. I think one of the funniest and scariest places I've ever um, ridden, again, didn't drive here, was in Jamaica. Because in Jamaica, they don't have laws that the steering wheel has to be on a certain side. And so oh they God. have cars oh <laughs> that have steering, like some cars have it on the right. Some cars have it on the left. It depends on where it was imported from. Oh yeah. And yeah. so when you're, when you're watching people drive it, like it's, it's very discombobulating because not only is it confusing, <laughs> like all the rules that we like rest assured with, even when you're at least in England and everything's on, on the, the right, right instead of the yeah. left, you know, you know, that type of thing. Well, the steering wheels on the right, it, it, it was very, yeah. And everybody kind of like drives in the middle of the road. Cause they don't, it, it, it's, it's very, um, yeah. challenging rules in many other countries are su- mere suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. 
Well, very good. Well, since we have not been together very much this summer, we have lots of questions that we need to go go through today. So Susan, tell us what questions we have. All right. Here's our first one. I listened to your podcast since I started my fertility journey this year. I enjoy and appreciate the time you take every week to inform and discuss issues affecting fertility patients and their partners. And thank you so much for listening. Okay. Um, my question is the following. I am a single 37 year old woman undergoing infertility treatment, but I am also stressed and worried about the financial aspect of my fertility treatment as my employer does not offer coverage in the benefits package, nor are they self-insured. What recommendations do you have for people going through the same thing I am going through now? What financial and stress-related alternatives can you recommend? Thank you so much. Okay, so <laughs> my my party line stress-wise is everyone should be issued a therapist at birth. <laughs> and there are very few things that um, are made worse by talking about with someone, particularly someone who's like impartial, who doesn't have any any skin in the game at all and so doesn't have to be necessarily a therapist that you pay for a lot of insurances will cover it with a fairly nominal copay um but there's support groups out there resolve is a great place to look there's uh look at your local facebook groups i know nevada has a, the uh, Nevada Fertility Advocates is the local group here. I know there's similar ones in both Texas and Tennessee. You know, most most cities have something. There's a lot of Facebook groups out there, but there's a lot of places to get support that are not that you don't have to pay for, and so that won't add to the financial stress of things. You know, be be cautious about what they can and can't do. You know, the the patients who say, "Oh, I went through this, therefore you should go through this." That is sometimes super helpful because it gives an option you hadn't necessarily thought about. However, it can also be very confusing because their story is not your story. And so being able to sort through that is the one kind of caveat to the, the mm -hmm. Facebook groups and the, the social support groups of, of other patients rather than necessarily professionals. Um, but and there's also a really good conference I hear coming up October the 28th in New Braunfels, Texas. It's a conference that we're putting on. We're going to have lots of specialists there to talk about all these issues. And we're also going to have lots of people there. So, you know, that uh, hopefully that would be a way you could find a supportive community as well, too. So we would love for you to come to our conference in October. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as far oh. as the financial part, Susan, I know you had you've talked with um, some people in Texas and I know we have some people coming to our conference that are going to talk about the, the financial aspect of it and maybe some ways that people can get funding, um, get some support or grants to go through. Yep. There, there are definitely grant options. Um, you know, there's different ways you can get grants. Um, sometimes it's kind of what I call participation grants where you go participate in a walk or something like that. And you can get grants based on a drawing. There's also grants that are based on kind of need and situation. If you're going for grants for need and situation, if it's your first time going through, I can say that those are often pretty hard um, mm -hmm. to get. Those often go to people who have been through at least one cycle on their own. Not always, but but that that's often a um, kind of you know, situation that, that we see. Um, but another thing is to advocate through your employer in that, um, you know, they can, you know, get packages that, um, do have fertility, uh, treatment options and not, you know, things like progeny often work with companies that are self-insured, but not a hundred percent. Okay. And, you know, really trying to help them understand how this is mm -hmm. great for maintaining, you know, their, their employees and giving good um, feedback and, and support during a time that, that can be quite challenging and help them maintain the longevity of their employee base. I would agree with all of that. All right. All right. Well, we are going to roll on with this question episode, Susan. What have you got next? Okay. So this is our next one. Hi, I'm 39 years old and have never been pregnant. My husband and I started our journey with an REI clinic 10 months ago, diagnosed with male factor, uh, low sperm count, low motility. My AMH at the time was 5.1. I have undergone two IVF retrieval cycles. We used Tessie, sperm, and ICSI both times. Cycle one resulted in 19 eggs, 14 mature, four blasts, one euploid. Um, my REI will not transfer mosaics. Cycle two resulted in 33 eggs, 11 mature, wow. 
10 fertilize, zero made it to blast. Mm. We, have, we have met with our REI and discussed cycle three with adjusted dosages and the mention of transferring at cleavage phase. We have also opted to forgo PGTA. Would you mind giving some insight on cleavage transfers? Also curious if you ever dissuade PGTA. Thanks. So most of us, I think all of us have have done cleavage transfers for the probably up until about, I don't know, eight or 10 years ago, that's all we did. <laughs> and so the tricky part about doing transfers, and usually that would mean around day three, um, when the embryo should have six to eight cells. Um, I, I will tell you, not personally, when I went through IBF, had cleavage st stage embryos transferred. So you definitely can get, um, you know, embryos and you can get pregnant in that way. But the really tricky part about that is how many to transfer. And back then, honestly, two, I mean, two was a low number. Usually we would transfer three because at cleavage stage, you know, you just didn't know how many would really continue on. Because if you think about it, when you, as you've gone through IVF, you know, from the stage of just a few cells to the stage of blastocyst, there's a lot of drop off. And so that's what we used to see back then too. We would transfer three embryos and we'd be lucky if one would implant and grow. And so you know, I think that lab techniques are better now and maybe more embryos will continue on, but you're still fighting with the, the genetic part of it too. You know, half of your embryos that you transfer are going to be genetically abnormal um, and, and actually more since you're 39. And so it's really honestly just a challenge to figure out how many to transfer and which ones to transfer, because the ones that are good on day three are not necessarily the ones that are going to be good as you watch them grow in the lab. And so it's really, I mean, I hate to say a crapshoot, but in some ways, I used to tell patients when we would transfer on that day, I would say, what scares you more, being pregnant with triplets or not being pregnant at all? And so, because we'd be debating, do we want to transfer two? Do, do we want to transfer three? Mm -hmm. But if you transfer three, you could end up with triplets or even more than that. And rarely in that day did we do that, probably because, again, lab techniques were not as good. And because um, those embryos would just peter out before development, but, you know, even though you had a bad outcome in your second cycle with no blasts, I mean, if you transferred cleavage stage embryos in that stage or in that cycle, I mean, who knows, but probably you wouldn't have had a better outcome. And so I still am a big fan of PGT personally, because it just gives you more information and gives you a better sense for what your likelihood is. And you're only going to be transferring one embryo, and that's going to significantly decrease your chances for multiple gestation. So um, that would be my vote. I, I think, oh, go ahead, Susan. I, I I kind of agree with what you alluded to earlier, Abby, in that, you know, back in the day that we did cleavage stage embryos, our labs were not as good as what they are now. And mm -hmm. I can say for our three labs, I feel very confident in that if, if you have an embryo that is not surviving to blast in the lab at this point in time, not necessarily historically, but at this point in the time, in, in time in a good lab, it, it's probably wasn't going to survive in you either. Um, 10, 15, 20 years ago, completely different ball game. Our, our techniques, and it's amazing even what happens year to year in, in our field and, yeah, and how it changes much dramatically. The, yeah. the lab is advancing. And, you know, just when you think that you're like, oh, wow, this is fantastic. There's something new that that's out there on the corner. And and I, I agree at 39, realize that you are, unfortunately, that advanced maternal age. And the one thing that we can control that can reduce your risk of bad things is transferring single embryos. And that's the, a great thing about PGTA-tested embryos. Um, anytime you are pregnant, as you get older, you're getting higher risk of things like blood pressure issues in pregnancy, um, diabetes, diabetes issues increased risk of C-section, complications of all those things. And if you're pregnant with more than one, which most people are going to tra transfer two or three cleavage stage embryos, you can always, you know, opt for just one, but most people are going to transfer multiples. If you get pregnant with multiples, all of those kind of health issues that can happen to you and baby are, have just been like amplified. Mm -hmm. And so more likely to happen. And, and, you know, no matter what, what we do, your safety is always our first priority. 
Thinking about some of the PGT aspect of that, the platform that they're using to do the PGT is very important. And the reason I say that, and I hear that you mentioned your doc doesn't transfer mosaics, which is a pretty common feeling. There's starting to be a little bit more movement to transfer mosaics, but the percentage of mosaics can vary widely based on the platform used. And so part of the the evaluation of this and part of the reason the three of us are on top of that is because relatively recently we um, in the last six months we had a lecture specifically targeted to this so the company that the three of us use with our ovation labs is called life view and one of the really beautiful things about life view is that it took a relatively rudimentary crayon drawing of <laughs> the, uh, of the chromosomes and turned it into a high def you know, very precise, every pixelated color is identifiable. And so what that means is that it took the standard percentage of mosaics, which is, you know, 20 ish percent and dropped it down to two to 3%. Mm -hmm. Because instead of looking at broad crayon strokes, you have all of these really very highly defined points of connection where they can take a look and say, yep, this is X is supposed to be there. X is there that point's good. Why is supposed to be there? Why is there? That's good. And they just click right through and it's about 800,000 different points. And what that means is that you get a lot more precise information. Now, there is a decent argument to be made that PGT doesn't, doesn't change the ultimate outcome. What it does change, however, is the time that it takes to get to pregnancy. Because let's say out of those four blasts you got in your first cycle, you transfer the first one, it doesn't work. You transfer the second one and you have a miscarriage. You transfer the third one, it doesn't work. All of that until you get to that fourth euploid one to transfer. So that could conceivably take you six months to a year to get through those three and be able to get to the one that transfers. So that's a really good argument for PGT. The argument against PGT is that it's expensive and that it bothers the embryo because you're going in and you're poking it and that there's always the chance for lab error. And so I've had patients where we've done multiple, multiple cycles and they're like, look, I can handle the thought of a termination if there's something really bad. I want to minimize any irritation to this embryo. So let's do that. And when you're on your third or fourth cycle, you know, most of us get a little bit more flexible in what we're going to try because the stuff we <laughs> haven't tried hasn't worked. And so that's, those are all pros and cons to consider. You know, if you were someone who would never, ever have a termination and having a child affected by a chromosomal abnormality is not okay, for whatever reason, it's not okay then keep doing the PGTA because the risk you take with, with uh, not doing PGTA is that you will find yourself in a very unpleasant, untenable position, which as, as all of the abortion rights change from state to state means that you may have to fly all the way across the country to handle a pregnancy that is going disastrously awry, like not what you planned. And so, you know, there's, there's the pros and cons with everything and you know, which value system is most important to you of what you value. Usually once you tell your doc that, the decision's pretty straightforward. So worth worth a lot of conversations, uh, usually not done in just a single consultation because you have the conversation, you think about it, you go back, have another one, think about it, you know, but some, some thoughts. Yep. Yeah. All Good right, point. our next one. Okay, so this one says, hi, I'm 39, husband's 43, just our first transfer of a PGT normal embryo, which unfortunately ended in miscarriage at nine weeks. My question is two parts. How often do you see tested embryos result in miscarriage and what causes it? We have two PGT normal embryos left to try, but also have six frozen untested embryos. I've heard that embryos don't always like to be frozen and unfrozen to be tested before being refrozen and then thought again for transfer. Is it something that is worth attempting to do before considering another egg retrieval or are the odds of the embryos not making it through the process too high? Love your insight on the podcast and appreciate you all for sharing your knowledge. Well, it's really disappointing when you lose a baby at any stage and particularly when you get past what you think are the big hurdles at nine weeks. And, you know, it's, it's, even though it's really sad for that to happen, I think the positive about that is you kind of made it through the window where we got an embryo in you it implanted, it grew, you know, it's hard to know what could have happened to that embryo. Um, There's a study that somebody did several years ago where they hysteroscoped, put a telescope in somebody's uterus 
after they had had kind of what you had a missed abortion where the baby just stopped growing and they were able to see in something like 25 percent morphologic changes changes in the baby that weren't normal so there's more than just genetics that go into development and implantation and you know i would look at this in the way i would look at anybody's miscarriage after we see a baby with a heartbeat is you know particularly if we are pretty certain you know 98 to 99 percent certain that it was a normal embryo I just see this as a fluke. You just had really bad luck and it sucks. It's the pits. But I think to me, the positive of it is you did so well for so long. It's really unlikely that lightning would strike twice and then the exact same thing would happen again. If it were me personally, I would want to hysteroscope you, make sure that your cavity looked okay or do some sort of imaging on your cavity. And then I would probably do the same stimulation again because it worked. You implanted, the baby grew. It just something went really wrong at nine weeks that probably didn't have anything to do with implantation at that point. I would also offer after I've transferred a chromosomally normal embryo and I've had a miscarriage, I do at least talk about doing testing for things like antiphospholipid antibody syndrome or APLS. APLS is an acquired blood clotting condition. You know, typically we don't run that test until somebody's had two miscarriages, but those rules were really designed for people who conceived naturally because as we know, 50% of those embryos that implant could be chromosomally abnormal. And so, um, you know, I think it's a, a reasonable thing to look at. As to your your question about embryos surviving the freeze and thaw process, there's actually pretty good data to say that most embryos, um, especially with current technologies with vitrification, so slow freezing um, was kind of an older technology where embryos they took a little bit more of a hit when they were when they were frozen and thawed and that type of thing. But with vitrification most embryos are going to do pretty darn well. Now, not necessarily all of your embryos may survive the freeze and thaw process, but having six embryos untested Mm -hmm. and be able to get those tested before doing another egg retrieval, I I think would be a great idea because really you want to know which of those three you need to be tested, you need to be transferring. And, um, you know, though PGT is not inexpensive, Generally, I think of it as it's approximately the price of a frozen embryo transfer. So if we choose poorly on one and transfer an embryo that ends up not being compatible with life, you would have already paid with for your PGT. And so if you only had maybe one or two embryos, I might not feel as strong. But at six embryos, I think it's probably a, a pretty good idea. And, and testing your embryos is going to be a whole heck of a lot less expensive than doing a whole egg retrieval. Mm -hmm. When you look at causes for miscarriage, um, that in a genetically tested embryo, there's still so many things that have to happen. It's not, we put a lot of emphasis on the chromosomes because that's what we're able to test. It's all we can do. (laughs) It's it's what we can do. I mean, when you've got, when all you've got is a hammer, everything's a nail. Um, but when you are looking at, at an embryo, there's still an awful lot of things that have to happen both with the uterus and with the embryo itself. So if the mechanics and the machinery within the embryo are not necessarily functioning at the top speed, you can still have a miscarriage carriage and, and have the chromosomes be totally fine. Most of the time, even when there's cross-checking that's done, it's the chromosomes were fine. It's that a, a piece of machinery didn't pick up and work the way that it should have. And so the baby stopped growing. Um, you know, it's, it's nothing you did. It's nothing that you or your REI have any control over. Cause believe me, if the REI did have control over it, nobody would ever have a miscarriage. Um, but we're all control freaks. Yeah. hundred <laughs> percent. Hundred percent. So, good luck. I hope your next one goes smoothly. All right, our next one. Hi, doctors. Thank you for the work that you're doing. You ladies have been a source of comfort and knowledge to me during my journey. I am a 29 year old female with PCOS. I had my egg retrieval, but only retrieved eight eggs. At my last ultrasound appointment a couple of days before, I had so many follicles on both ovaries. My doctor didn't even bother to count them all. There were well over 10 on each side. He said I responded well to the stimulation protocol and then on retrieval, we would get a lot of eggs. That night, I did my HCG trigger shot at 10.30 p.m., then a day of no shots followed by retrieval at 9.30 a.m. Is it common to lose follicles before retrieval day? Could I have ovulated in the hours leading up to surgery? Did I do something wrong? So we seem to 
imply that when we do X, we're going to get Y and maybe 98% of the time, if we do X, we get Y, but all of us have seen situations. I'm thinking of a couple of people right now that I probably would have told them the same thing that, oh yeah, you have a really good egg count. And then we go in to retrieve eggs and they just don't come out. And, you know, I always tell patients now before I go into egg retrieval that I can see the fluid filled sac containing the egg, but I can't see the egg and I do my best. I sometimes I even put fluid back in a second time and open the follicle back up, try and cure it, try and scrape the egg out. But by about the third or fourth time, if I don't get the egg, it's probably not going to come out. And unfortunately, I don't know why. And I'm just as frustrated and upset as you are. And so I don't think that you did anything wrong. Um, sometimes if you were my patient, Sometimes I would look at maturity. Sometimes in PCOS, the eggs are just not quite as mature. And for whatever reason, they just stick a lot more firmly and they're harder to come out if they're just not so mature. So I know that your doctor is probably going to look at your stimulation next time around. And we all have talked about this before. Anytime we have a patient that doesn't do the way we like for them to do or the way we want them to do, <clears throat> we'll treat this, tweak the stimulation. And hopefully by adding in something like human menopausal gonadotrophin or HCG, that will help the maturity of the eggs and may help the follicles release the egg. And so, again, it's hard to know why the eggs didn't come out, but sometimes that happens, unfortunately. Sometimes it's helpful to look at the maturity of the eggs um, or the, the size of the follicles, I guess, is probably the better way to say that, because they're you can have 20 follicles that are growing, but if all of them are relatively small, like let's say you've got five or six that are in that 18 millimeter and higher range, but all the rest are, you know, 16 or less, then that is a very different expectation than if you have 20 follicles that are, you know, 17, 18 and, and larger. So that's one thing to look at. And there are many docs because traditionally we were told you get three 18 millimeter follicles <laughs> and, trigger. and, and you trigger. trigger. Um, and so that's a, that's a different, um, that's a different ball game than, than what we can do now with frozen embryo transfers, where we can push them longer safely. The other thing is the type of trigger that was used and the length of time. You know, sometimes it's more beneficial to do a 34 hour trigger. Like if your doc thinks, Hey, maybe, maybe the reason we didn't get them is because you ovulated early, then maybe you switch to, instead of a 35 hour trigger, you go to a 34 hour trigger. Um, on the flip side, if they think, well, maybe they weren't mature, maybe you push to a 36 hour trigger, you know, maybe you, um, give a double dose of Lupron for your trigger. Maybe you try and give a little bit of HCG, which when you're talking over 20 eggs, that is a scary thing. None of well, us want to. She had an this. HCG trigger for her first one. No. Oh. Oh, yeah, I would say she probably might be a good candidate for a Lupron trigger or at least maybe a combo trigger. Yeah, cause... I would do a dual. Yeah. Um, and... HCG may help the eggs come out a little bit better is what you're saying than the Lupron, right? No, she did HCG the first time. Sometimes people respond a little better to one versus the other. And especially if her doctor might push her a little bit longer to get those follicles yeah. to be a little bit higher. Uh, you know, her HCG, her, her, sorry, her estradiol level was probably rising and who knows what the actual, and also the amount of HCG she was using may have been a lesser amount if, the, yeah. the, if the doc was worried about OHSS. Yeah. Checking the HCG levels the day after trigger sometimes can help you titrate them to know, okay, I need at least 3000 units to hit hit that lower threshold so that you're not taking a 10,000 shot where you're going to really put yourself at higher risk of, of hypersim, but you, you get enough HCG to be effective and you do Lupron at the same time and see if that, that helps. Like there's a lot of little things to tweak, you know, your, your doc should have a, a better idea looking back at the stim and, and looking, you know, hindsight's 2020. 20. And so seeing, okay, if I was going to do this again, I would do whatever. Mm -hmm. IVF is not only therapeutic in that we're helping you try to achieve pregnancy, but it's also diagnostic. There's things we learn through every thing, single IVF stimulation, and that makes mm -hmm. the next stimulation even better and more tailor-made to your particular circumstance. All right. Very good. Okay. All right. So the next one um, is uh, she's a 27 year old female with husband who's um, 30, trying to conceive for a year, got pregnant and then had a miss miscarriage approximately six weeks. Didn't find out until 12 weeks. It's been a little over six months and hasn't gotten pregnant again. Doctors haven't seen concern. So she still hasn't been referred to a fertility clinic. 
Um, she's planning on asking for a referral at her next appointment in a month. It'll be eight cycles since the miscarriage. Is that a reasonable amount of time to wait or do I need to wait longer before seeing a specialist? No tests have been re run regarding our fertility and I just want answers. Thanks in advance. So whenever, whenever you're asking a person a question, you have to know what background that person is coming from. And so the three of us are fertility specialists. We see all of the crazy <laughs> things. And so our default answer is always going to be, yep, this is, this is worthwhile. You're at the eight month point. By the time you actually get in with the doc, uh, you're going to be probably, you know, 10 ish months or so. And, um, at that point, yes, we we tend to start at least getting the testing. Um, your general OBGYN may say, no, give it another six months after that, get to a solid year since conceiving, and then we'll refer you out. So a lot of this is perspective. With miscarriages, 50% of them, we're going to run every single test we know of and can think of, and they're all going to be normal. So while I very much respect the desire for answers, because again, we are all control freaks, um, you don't always get them. And that frustrates us just as much as it frustrates you because we want nothing more than to say, oh, X, Y, Z is wrong. We're going to do ABC to fix it. And then in uh, this specific amount of time, we should be able to move forward. You should be pregnant and away we go. Um, and so, you know, I think, I think most of us would say, yeah, go ahead and get the referral in the works. It takes a little while to get in and get stuff started and, you know, wait for your period so you can do testing, things like that. But even if your doc says, wait a couple more months, the glorious thing about this is that you are 27 years old, which in our world, you are but an itty bitty baby. We and love 27 year olds. We love 27 year olds. <laughs> we love and you all. More yes. importantly, yes. we also love 28 year olds. And so <laughs> if you're waiting, you know, another six months, it's okay. Like we gotcha. We'll. But we'll... if you're anxious, ask for a referral. It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Nobody's going to fall to you in that. No, no. The worst they can say is no. When you wait another couple months, it's fine. All right. I think we've got time for one more. One more. Yeah. All right. I'm about to have my egg retrieval appointment. My pre-op instructions say to remove all makeup and jewelry prior to the retrieval. <laughs> this includes all types of nail polish, no perfume, lotions, or scented skin products. My question to you lovely ladies is how critical is this? What if my deodorant is unscented? Can I use a tiny bit of fragrance-free concealer? What about my soap, shampoo, conditioner, hair products, and laundry detergent? For the laundry detergent, I know I'll be in a hospital gown, but will the scent from my clothes still be on my skin and be an issue? That is such an interesting question. I don't think anybody has ever asked that question before. It's a great well, one. It's a it's great, a great one. question. It's a great so one. embryos are really persnickety. They really don't like scents and odors and smells. And so many of our labs have positive pressure systems so that like when you go in, you almost have to push a little bit extra hard to get the door open because it pushes particles and scents and things out. We hope, you know, I think it's like anything in life, you know, I wouldn't wear perfume. I would try and limit all those things as much as you can. Um, you know, we don't, because every now and then we have, you know, situations where we have patients that come in and you can smell them before you can see them. Mm -hmm. And it's don't not necessarily your Avita products. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, those lavender scents, scented things I love, but just don't wear your lavender scented soap or, or you know, lotion that reeks. Cause those are the kind of things that we, you know, that's kind of in the category. We don't exactly know what impact it has, but we know scents are not good. So try to avoid those things. I don't think you have to go to the extreme, extreme, extreme and, you know, use HIPAA cleanse to wash your body off before you get into the lab. But I think anything that you can do to kind of minimize that will be helpful. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Like, I don't think putting on concealer is, is going to make a huge amount of difference. I don't think putting on your deodorant is likely to make a difference unless you wear like old spice. Um, <laughs> that will potentially make a difference. Um, but but most, most of the general things that common sense would say, I eh, probably shouldn't wear this. Like, you know, wear the very unscented lotion that day, not, not your sweet smelling one. The shampoo and conditioner, you're going to wash it out. So there may be a very mild smell. We're going to put a cap on you anyway. I, I wouldn't worry about that it's, unless it's, it's something that's really potent. Yeah. It's not a day to focus on your aromatherapy. Okay. <laughs> I've had patients who have like doused themselves essential oils. in essential oils beforehand. <laughs> and I'm like, I walk in and I'm like, oh my goodness. Um, we need you to wash some of it off. Like, you know, and 
you know, I know some people find a lot of comfort and Zen from, from those scents and those types of things. You can do that when you get home. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, but just not, not for egg retrieval, not for embryo transfer. Oh, and one of the things she mentioned too was fingernail polish. And that there is a real thing to that. We we have to put the pulse oximeter or some centers put the pulse oximeter on your finger. And it's a way that we keep track of your oxygen saturation. And if you've got, you know, a nail on or you have, you know, you've dipped your nail or you have um, polished your nail, it's difficult for the O2 sat monitor to work. So really, you probably do need to take your fingernail polish off too. And the jewelry part is actually one of the important ones for the egg retrieval, because if for some reason you had bleeding and we would need to use what we call cautery, which is a little device that kind of burns to make bleeding stop, you can't have piercings um, metal jewelry, yeah. in, jewel metal, metal jewelry in. And so that that's the big reason for that. And so in those are piercings anywhere and everywhere. So if yes. it is Every in, location please has take to be it take out. It. <laughs> that's right. So on that note, ladies, I think we've covered lots of things. Um, to our audience, thanks for listening and tune in next week for more. Be sure to subscribe and leave us a review in iTunes. Be sure and come to our conference October the 28th in New Braunfels, Texas. We would love for you guys to come and sign up and we would love to meet you. You can also visit fertilitydocsuncensored.com to submit specific questions or register for the conference. All questions are answered anonymously uh, on our Ask the Doc segment, so don't hold back. We love episode ideas. We want to hear from you. We want to see you come, come hang out with us. As always, this podcast is intended for entertainment and is not a substitute for medical advice from your own physician. All right. We'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye. Bye.